I'm Matthew O'Coin, and this is Living the Classical Life. I often sometimes wonder why operatic plots have to be so complicated. I can just think of Figaro, which I know you're preparing these days, and it's if you try to think of all the characters and what they're doing and how they're crossing each other, don't you ever just feel like listening to the music? I mean... In Figaro, I happen to think it's an exception. I happen to think that all the convolutions are justified because Mozart is so obsessive about individuating the characters. Um, it's not just like, ugh, you know, I guess he likes her and she likes the other guy, but who really cares because they're all just here to make a farce. In Figaro, Figaro and Susanna have the best romantic relationship in all of opera. They're friends as well as lovers, which is something I don't think you can say about almost any other couple. The Count is a slave to his desires, but sympathetic. He, he, there are bounds that he won't cross. And the Countess is this sad, proud, prematurely old figure. You can hear in her music that she's not actually that old. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the... These, these little gestures, they're flickerings of youth that have, that's been, it's been buried, but it's, it's all there. Somehow it is all there. And every convolution of the plot illuminates a new aspect of, of the character's personalities. I mean, I should think of examples. The famous climactic moment when the Count finally asks forgiveness, um, it illuminates the opposition of his character to the Countess's in the subtlest way. He asks for forgiveness with this sort of yearning gesture. It's full of appoggiaturas or leans, you know. Countess responds with music that is identical in phrase structure and in how long it takes. If you look at the intervals, the pressure points, uh, the points that Mozart chooses to, to land on, the count begins with the archetypal sort of yearning interval, the major sixth, and then on a six four chord, he's in kind of a weak position, he has to resolve then he's in an even more vulnerable position. And then on the next pressure point, he's in another vulnerable position. The Countess, they're married, so they speak sort of similarly. She responds with similar phrases, but it's poised.
So rather than she's she's starting from a position of power. She's starting from the more stable interval and then moving confidently through it, and she ends. It's the tiniest difference, but it illuminates the resolution of the opera, the fact that a deeply unstable piece has been achieved because he is revealing his helplessness and she's revealing her inner poise. And then he pulls a sleight of hand that I don't think it's ever quite been matched. He has everyone say, now we're all gonna be happy. And he sets it to the saddest music anyone's ever heard. You know, It's like they have to fortify themselves to convince themselves they're actually going to be happy. Oh. There's a kind of helplessness to it. It's like a, in a Bach cantata, that kind of, we are bound to be this way. And actually, in the text, the way that he elongates the phrases, you can hear it two ways. A tutti contenti saremo così. Which can either mean, we will all be happy like this from now on. Or it can mean, we're going to be like this, so let's try to be happy. Saremo così. We will be like this. Um, so there's this kind of, it's a moment of, of clarity, and that when you have to end with an allegro, it's the 18th century after all, um, it feels like, and they say, okay, now let's go watch the fireworks. And it really does feel like, what else is there to do? For me, it's the saddest moment in all of opera, actually. They, they sing this, this phrase and it resolves and you think, what can actually happen? This allegro that follows, uh, it has this kind of desperation to it. It's just like, you know, they've seen everything about how life is going to be, and there's nothing left to do but set it all on fire. What's your favorite moment in the opera? Maybe that, but maybe also the uh, final acceleration in the Act Two finale, uh, which is just like, you know, the dramatic crisis has been achieved, and yet somehow he manages to turn the screw even a little bit tighter for this final two-minute segment. Well, it's a good piece. You should all come yeah. and see it <laughs> at the Met with fingers crossed, because at this time... At the time of taping there is still some uh, uncertainty. You started out playing in a rock band. How did well, you make- Well, it's a circuitous path, actually, because I started with classical music and then got disillusioned nice and early, which is good because you get it out of the way uh, and you go back to having illusions afterwards. Um, yeah, I was, I was all classical all the time between the ages of about six and 11, 12, and then found that the atmosphere at the competitions and festivals where I was playing as a pianist and sometimes my own music, it was very dry. And I found that some of my peers who were also pretty into music, some of them were doing it at the behest of their stage parents. And I was just allergic to the atmosphere. Had you considered 
a life in touring as a pianist? In hindsight, I was always doomed to be a composer because I was never, I, I could spend all day at the piano, but I wasn't especially good at playing pieces without making something up. I would always twist the harmonies around and it would drive my teachers crazy. Um, and in hindsight, I should have just said, I think I want to make things up. Um, so yeah, around, I guess, the onset of puberty, which makes sense, I found myself looking for a different milieu and uh, I was lucky enough to have some friends in my town who were really good musicians who played in rock and jazz bands and they were great uh, partners in experimentation. And then a few years later, I was 16 or 17, I began to feel again that I need, needed the wide canvas of classical music. Mm. Because for me, I was once sort of misquoted as saying that I, I, was, I chose classical music because of its complexity. That's not it at all. It can be complex, but it can also be radically simple. It can be way simpler than pop music too. You know, there can be a great Kortag piece that's four notes. You know, try getting a four note pop song on the radio. It's just freer. It's just a broader canvas with more materials. And I found myself missing that the more that I played rock music. I still love uh, the kind of music I was making then, but I was restless. So being a rock musician, in fact, was influential for you as a classical musician? I would say, especially my jazz training. Um, because even though I don't perform jazz anymore, on some level I think like a jazz musician. Um, I, I prefer the way harmony is taught and rhythm um, in the jazz world. I, I think the differences are uh, that rhythm is taught at all in some cases, that, you, that there's this sense of, of uh, responsibility. Uh, there's a saying, you know, everyone's responsible for the time. You know, everyone has to be feeling a deep pulse. Um, everyone has to be feeling even the beats that they're not playing. Um, that's totally essential if you're going to conduct. But I sometimes wish that in large classical ensembles, there was more of a spirit of we're all in this together. Let's all be listening even to other parts. Um, so that's a mentality that I haven't given up and hope I never will. So you've composed operas and you conduct them. You're now conducting at the Met and you put assistant on- Assistant conducting. Assistant conducting, yes. Well, it's still the Met. And you also put on a production of Tchaikovsky's Eugene Onegin at Juilliard. How did you come to opera? How did, was there a particular draw? I also love words, uh, whether in the form of poetry or essays whatever. Um, I'm not a big fan of this attitude some of us musicians have that music is just beyond words and it, it can express things that words could never express. I mean, that is true, but it's also true that words can do things music can't do. You know, John Ashbery's poetry can do things that Ali Nussen's music cannot do. And that's sort of the way it should be. And really early on, I was also you know, writing stories and reading like crazy. And opera just seemed like the ideal fusion uh, of the two. In reality, it's usually very far from ideal. Um, but uh, I keep returning to opera because I love the internal dynamism, the kind of mutual pressure relationship that words and music put on each other when you bring them together. What do you say to all the young audiences today who feel, who might feel that opera is an antiquated art form? Is opera still relevant today? I would say first broaden your definition of opera. Um, for me, opera means the bringing together of multiple art forms. Um, 
and with as much attention and care to all of them. Um, if you're going to put an opera on stage, you have to care about sound in both the musical and verbal uh, senses. You need to care about the design. You need to care about the relationship of instruments to voices. You need to care about theater. Um, and that doesn't mean that it has to be with a 75-piece romantic orchestra with costumes that look a certain way. O opera can be almost anything. And I think it's actually going to prove resilient because it's going to be reinvented as it has for, you know, centuries. When you're writing your music, who is your intended audience? Or are you aware of a particular audience? Um, I tend to prefer to think that I'm writing to you, whoever you are, but not to a group of people. Um, I think that's one of the great things about music is that it can treat an infinite number of people as individuals. So why waste that wonderful quality of music by thinking, oh gosh, it's going to be premiered for uh, a bunch of 18-year-olds and they might not like it. Of course, there are external circumstances that will dictate certain parameters with a piece. You know, you'll know that it's going to be premiered in a hall of a certain size and that it's going to be roughly a certain length. That's good. Get that out of the way before you actually start composing. Because if it if it creeps into your mind while you're composing, it's not helpful. You've, one of the things you've mentioned with your admiration for Verdi is that part of his genius encompassed a human scale for his music. Is that something that you aspire to in your, in your operas or your other compositions as well? I don't think it would be wise for anyone to emulate the way Verdi got good. By which I mean in his early works, they're just so uh, brutal, almost clunky. There is this kind of energy in them. You, you really sense that this guy's got his hand on the current somehow, but he hasn't figured out a comfortable way to write for the strings. He hasn't uh, figured out certain issues of pacing, whatever. The miraculous thing about him is that every work gets better all the way until he's in his 80s. He just never stops getting better. Um, he had a quality of direct address, direct emotional address that I don't think can be learned. So I try to emulate aspects of dramatic timing from especially later Verdi, um, total economy of, uh, of material uh, in especially middle Verdi, for example. Um, but I try to be a little bit more, I don't know how to put it, um, craftsman-like in the way I treat the musical materials, because he was only writing operas. Um, and if you're only writing operas from a very young age, you're dealing with gigantic chunks of text that you need to set to music. And so there's a certain loss of subtlety uh, if that's all you're doing early on. I think I'm coming at opera from a different angle. Mm -hmm. What's the role of subtlety in an art form that can often be performed in a hall of three or four or 5,000 people? In relation to a rock concert that's being performed in a hall of 30 or 40 or 50,000 people, it's plenty subtle. I don't actually think opera is all that good at uh, big, crude gestures. Sure, it can do that, but Broadway can do it better. <laughs> the thing that opera can do better is, you know, the total care and attention to every aspect of orchestration um, and timing, which means if a piece needs five hours to be good, okay, make it five hours long. Uh, there are still opera houses in the world that would be willing to go for something like that. How did your family feel about you become, becoming a musician? 
they were always really supportive. Um, we don't have any professional musicians in the family. We have lots of music lovers. Um, early on, totally supportive. Then a little wary, because it just seems so improbable that you can make a living doing it. And then when I started conducting and also vocal coaching, um, they were reassured. Um, no one's as surprised as I am that I'm mostly composing these days. Um, that's a leap that I wouldn't have expected to take. When did so. you start composing? Uh, right at the beginning, when I was six. Um, uh, that was really the impulse. I know for some people the impulse is to m just master the instrument. For me it was to make stuff up. What is so. a creative process like? The actual process, for me at least, it's not improvisatory exactly. I'm, I'm playing up until the point where I'm stuck and I'm testing all the possible ways to go forward. You know, writing music's always if-then. You, you write down one note and that's an if. And you have to find a then, which is the next note, which becomes the next if. Um, and there are some very good composers for whom this is not the case. You might listen to their music and go, okay, you're doing what you want. You're not following unwritten laws. But with some composers, Bach comes to mind, Stravinsky comes to mind, you feel that it almost doesn't matter where the piece begins. Just give them any note and they will find the right note to follow it. Um, that's why I, I love Stravinsky, is that there's this kind of uh, faith in the inherent dynamism of the musical material, um, which means that you can start with an ideal that might seem trivial in someone else's hands uh, and have faith that if you engage with it in the right way, it'll lead you somewhere interesting. Whenever we make music, we're engaging with something unknown. We're testing the waters, and we're not sure how deep they go, or what creatures might uh, surface out of them. And as a composer, what that means is to leave behind the desires that you might have had before you sat down and picked up the pencil to allow something more interesting to happen. By that I mean sometimes you think, oh, this could be an interesting beginning to a piece. That, that could happen. And your mind runs away with itself and, and you think, oh, and this could happen, and this could happen, and this could happen. And you could, if you let the musical ego remain in control, you could just write those things down and say, play them. But I really believe that there are, you know, thermodynamic forces in music that will prevent those things from happening if you're honest. Scriabin was always in search of the metaphysical. Is that something that enters in, into your creative process, trying to summon uh, metaphysical energies? Uh, I try not to think about it. You know, Scriabin, while we're on that note, he's always telling you that his things are divine or ecstatic, but by minute 45 of one of those pieces, I'm not sure anymore. The material seems to me to be unvaried. It's, it's a case of, uh, look, I'm, I'm guessing here, but an hour-long piece that's about ecstasy, even in the title, um, to me suggests a kind of pre-compositional process of, I'm going to write the most ecstatic piece ever! And I'm not convinced that the musical material actually wanted to <laughs> speak for an hour. The material sounds tired by about halfway through. That's, that's one of the risks. Tell me about your opera, Heart Crane. How did you come to choose the work of this rather now, unfortunately, obscure poet uh, and writer? He's a Cleveland hero, and that's how I came to know his work. How did he become your operatic subject? Well, he was a ludicrous 
overreacher. He wanted words to kind of blast off into music, um, which is something that attracted me to his work when I was very young. And then by the time I started writing the opera, I found some of it a little bit overblown. This long poem, The Bridge, there's fantastic stuff in there and there are whole sections that you, know, you just want to say less, less. Um, but quite apart from the poetry, his life was an opera waiting to happen. Um, he died extremely young in a dramatic suicide after Failed advances on a sailor, apparently, at sea. Yes, at sea, you know, he was gay and he had, was living with a woman at that time and that was falling apart and... Um, but more poignantly, he really tried to just exist as a poet for about 15 years. And the things that knocked him down, I mean, he was working manual labor jobs and couldn't even make enough money you know, doing that. It was, it's an interesting life. Um, and I, I was drawn to it. I, I got to know the, the critic Harold Bloom uh, when I was an undergrad. Is he the one who wrote How to Read Poetry? How to Read and Why? Yes, I'm reading that Among right now. 10,000 other books. Exactly. Um, he's a big Crane supporter, so I sought him out just to sort of uh, see what he, he could offer. And his first reaction was, you don't need to turn Crane into an opera, he already is one. <laughs> um, but then I played him some of, the, uh, so, some of the music and he was actually convinced that it, that it could work. Um, but the challenge with setting Crane is that there's already so much music jammed in there that if you set it to music, it does feel almost like you're <laughs> It's one exponent too far. So I ended up just choosing fragments of the poems and you often don't even hear it as poetry. It, it enters the musical texture. Would you ever consider writing art song? Have you written art song? Yes. Um, I tend to like setting other people's words more than my own <laughs> with art song because I want the, the pressure of somebody else's sense of rhythm. Um, I love setting uh, James Merrill, uh, who is a real master of rhythm, recent American poet. Um, I've done a lot of settings of, of the German poet Paul Celan, um, who was a Holocaust survivor who managed to not r write just about the Holocaust. He was more interested in purifying words that he felt had become dirtied by um, misuse during the war. Um, he, he had this amazing ability to see words as musical objects. And I think he wanted to take words that had been, you know, words are like chords. They, in either one, if, if they get used a certain way for a long time, you come to think that that's the only thing it means and you stop seeing all the other possibilities in it, you know, which is why, you know, you take a C major chord and if you think the only thing a C major chord can do is, if you think that's the only way it can behave, you know, eventually it's gonna take someone like Terry Riley to just, okay, you're just gonna hear that chord just for, uh, until the possibility of going is like the most seismic, musical shift. Um, that's what Paul Salon did with words of the German language. He, he's obsessive about words like bread and star and basic sort of uh, imagistic words. And he'll use them intentionally in a nonsensical way, a musical way, um, to cleanse your ears of the associations that you have with these words. Um, it's a musical activity. Um, and so I was really attracted to setting that language uh, to music. What's inspiring you these days, Matt? <laughs> you know, I'm deep inside of this opera that's going up in Boston next year. 
I don't want to say it's past the point of inspiration, but the th whatever inspired this piece inspired it a long time ago. And now I'm carrying out. This is your own opera. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm carrying out whatever that inspiration was. So I don't know, nothing new quite yet. I'll need something new in a couple months. Well, we wish you much luck with your future projects and your future successes, and it will be fascinating to see how they unfold. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>